Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is algebra. Today, uh, I would like to tell you something about rings. So what is a ring? Well, a ring is a generalization of integers and it actually comes, the, the name is slightly misleading. It has nothing to do with the ring you put on your finger. It comes from the German word Zahlring, which basically means um, a collection of things that have similar properties to integers. So ring is more meant in the sense here of, well, for example, Wikipedia gives the example of spy ring, like um, an association and uh, a collection of, of similar objects. Um, and indeed, what I'm trying to explain is that rings generalize integers. In, uh, yeah, and what, what you would do in something like ring theory is you would study properties that generalize to general rings or to some special kinds of rings, um, whatever, Euclidean rings or principal ideal, ideal domains. We will see some of them, not today, but certainly we'll see some of them. And um, the whole point why this is interesting for algebra is that rings appear when studying roots of polynomials. That's where, where they came from. They came from those Zahl rings, which uh, I will show you two examples of Zahl rings, or actually three examples, but one of them is the first one we start with, and it's a good old friend, of course, the integers themselves, right? If you want to generalize the integers, we should look at the integers. And you all know how the integers look like, it's just the, the number line. Um, not quite the number line, it would be something like more like the real numbers, but kind of the discrete points on the number line. And um, what you observe is that you have two operations, and of course, all of you know those two operations. You can add numbers, A plus B, or you can multiply numbers. And usually I, I omit the, to write whatever. Usually everyone omits to write this. So instead of writing A times B, you just write AB. I mean, this is well known, right? We, we all know that. We, we were all grown up with knowing that we have these, those two operations. And whenever you have two things on an object, like two operations, you should kind of ask for comparability of those operations. Otherwise it would be like, Okay, you have two operations on, on, on a set, but they have nothing to do with one another. So why should I consider both of them together anyway, right? And the comparability relation is exactly what you think it is. It's, it's, it's this distributivity. So A plus B times C uh, in various forms is AC plus BC. Uh, so this tells you how multiplication and addition are related. Otherwise you just observe well, as a universe for itself, addition forms an abelian group, which just means AB is BA, and there's an additive inverse, uh, which you call zero, and there, sorry, there's a negative inverse, which you call minus A, and there's a, an additive unit, which you call zero. And um, kind of the same is true for, for times, with the difference that you don't have uh, inverses. If you would throw in inverses for, for multiplication, you would end up with the definition of a field. And that's going a step too far. So fields are a little bit ill-behaved uh, in, in co compared to rings in some sense, at least. So let's just stay with those two operations. So here's a, um, the unit is, of course, one. So you have one and zero, right? One is multiplicative, the unit. So a, a times one is a. And yeah. Uh, a plus zero is what's way. Okay, we all know that. And now, uh, well, why not try to generalize this, right? So whatever you do in mathematics is usually you take your favorite concept, something that you really like. And I definitely like the integers. The integers are really good. And we try to generalize it. So um, the first thing people did is they studied, uh, well, roots of polynomials. So let's say you have a polynomial, something like x squared plus one, and you wonder, can I find a solution of x squared plus one? It turns out you can't, at least not uh, well, in, in the usual sense, but you still can, um, because if you want to go to the complex numbers. But in order to solve this equation, you don't really need complex numbers. And that was kind of the first observation people made uh, but you rather only need a square root of minus one. You rather just need an element that you call i that satisfies exactly this equation, i squared plus one equals zero. Or in other words, i is something like the square root of minus one. 
That's the only thing you need to know. You don't, you don't need to know any fancy complex numbers or any fancy real numbers or something like that. No, no, no. You only need to know this one element that satisfies x squared plus one. So, so i squared plus one equals zero. This is the root of this polynomial. And if you do that and you just say, okay, I take my integers z and I want to have this element that I call i then you end up with what is people call the Gaussian integers. And well, the integers is just a number line, right? With, with discrete points, uh, well, the integer values and the Gaussian integers is just a two dimensional version of this. So all of these grid points here are Gaussian integers. For example, this is three plus two i, right? One, two, three, one, two. So this direction is the i direction. And this direction is the usual direction. And you observe that exactly the same thing holds. You can add them, and you can multiply them. And well, how does it work? So for example, this is i, then this is i plus one. Why? Well, because you can add in this direction, just the one, and this would be two i, for example, because in this direction, you would add an i. Uh, this would be i minus one because in this direction, you, sub, you subtract, right? You have, you have, in two directions, you have the integers. That's basically what it is. And you can also convince yourself that they have a multiplication rule, just because if you want to do something like a plus bi, and you just multiply them as polynomials, because that's what they are, right? So um, a prime plus uh, whatever, b prime i, and you just factor it and what you get is a a prime and you get b times b prime but now you have i squared and i squared we just decided is is uh, minus one so you get this and you get the mixed terms with an i let me just write the i in front so a b plus uh sorry a b prime and b a prime and this is the multiplication rule on the Gaussian integers, which is, of course, just mimicking the multiplication rule, or it is the multiplication rule of the complex numbers you're all used to. But the point is, you don't need to know complex numbers just to solve this equation, right? You don't really need to know that. It's just enough to know this ring. And this is, again, an example of a ring, because, of course, this operation is compatible, and, well, the other two properties also hold. And that's what people study. People were interested in solving polynomial equations as usual. That's what mathematicians do all the time. And yeah, to, to solve those polynomial equations, you need to extend the integers a little bit. You, you need to have a more general version of the integers. And people came up, well, Gauss in this case, came up with the Gaussian integers, which as we will see, uh, have very similar properties to the integers themselves. So maybe it makes sense to study them uh, under a more general umbrella. And that's exactly the umbrella of, of rings. And yeah, so motivated by Gaussian integers, people study something similar. For example, you can just take, okay, maybe I don't have the e equation x squared plus one equals zero, but maybe I want to solve x plus x squared plus x plus one equals zero. And you end up with what's called the Gaussian, uh, the Einstein integers. Um, so I have my omega element and the omega element satisfies exactly this. And you can again check that there is a reasonable multiplication and addition on elements of this form. Again, if you treat them as polynomials, just using all the time that, that you have this equation. So whenever you see omega squared, you can actually rewrite it in terms of um, minus one minus omega, right? Because you have, you have this equation. And if you do this, uh, well, like this one was a two-dimensional version of the of the integers, then you still get a two-dimensional version of the integers. Just well, omega is a different root of a polynomial, so it, it, it's slightly a different grid type thing. So here's omega, here's one, and you can do exactly the same thing if you go um, uh, three steps. In, in this direction and two, two steps in omega direction. So this is the omega direction. You end up here. So let me, let me, let us do this. So three steps, one, two, three, and then omega direction. That's a bit confusing. Omega direction goes this way. So one, two, and you end up exactly here. 
And these are called the Gaud Einstein integers. And they have exactly, again, very similar properties to the, um, uh, to the, to the integers. In particular, you have compatibility and uh, two operations, which satisfies the user requirement. So that's what people studied in various versions of this. Basically take your favorite polynomial and well, adjoin, let's say adjoin an, an element to the integers that satisfies this polynomial equation. And that's all you really need to study those polynomial equations. Right? That's the whole point. Again, I don't need to know what the complex numbers are. Of course, secretly here in the background, I have my, my complex plane, but I don't really need to know that. I can do this um, more discrete type of thing. And algebra is like discrete types of things. And yeah, and if you believe that, and if you believe that there are zillions of these examples, people have discovered roughly in the 19th century, so beginning to the end of 19th century somewhere, um, then you would just do exactly that. A, a ring is just a set which behaves like the integers. Strictly speaking, slight catch here, be careful. What I just explained is more like a commutative ring, what people would call a commutative ring. And uh, what people usually call a ring is more a generalization of matrices. And as you all know, for matrices, you usually don't have A times B equals B times A. But let's ignore that. Let's, let's say a commutative ring is really just a generalization of the integers in the sense that you have an addition with the multiplication, uh, it forms an abelian group and a abelian monoid uh, for addition and multiplication and it distributes, right? Those, those operations are not completely um, unrelated, but they distribute over one another. And you have found the definition of a commutative ring. And the only thing we did is we looked at those examples like roots of polynomials and we added basically the roots of the polynomials to our ground field in order to be able to solve those equations, right? So this equation now has a solution in the Gaussian integers by construction, it's just i or plus minus i to be completely precise. This has now a solution in the Einstein integers. It's, it's a version of omega. It could be this omega, it could be this omega, for example, as well. So that's where the notion of a ring came from. People try to solve polynomial equations, that's what we always do. And as soon as you accept that, that, okay, we have the integers, we now have generalized the integers, then you would look for various properties that also generalize. Um, so for example, in the, um, the integers, I'm going to explain that in a different video and more carefully, but in the integers, you have something like prime numbers, right? So A times B, uh, so A equals B times C, or prime numbers would mean one of them is a or plus minus a. And so let's say there's b is equals a plus minus. Because you're in integers, you always have minus as well. Kind of a confusing thing. People would say up to, up to, um, up to units. And the Gaussian prime is exactly the same thing. But now you have more things to play around with. So actually you say b is plus minus i times. And well, you, you, here's an example. So two, for example, here wouldn't be a, a prime number anymore. And five wouldn't be a prime number. And I've written down here precise condition when, when a Gaussian integer is a Gaussian prime. But they still have exactly the same properties. Or in this case, they do. So every Gaussian integer can be uniquely factorized into primes. Right, so you have just generalized not just integers, but also the notion of prime numbers. And actually, they look pretty beautiful. Let me let me actually show you show to you how Gaussian primes look like. So here's the Mathematica file. Link is in the description. Basically, the Gaussian primes. Um, you can zoom in or out, and yeah, well, you can't see anything anymore. Um, so let's go to this. Uh, so here's zero. Here's one, two, three. Three is a prime in the Gaussians, four, five, five is not, as I have shown you, we'll see that in a second again. Seven again is a prime and so on. And you also go in this direction, three times i is a prime, that's here. Um, this is three times i plus two, that's a prime. So all of these squares actually are prime numbers in the Gaussians. And you see this fourfold symmetry here because, well, the root you adjoined is actually this i. So i squared, definitely i has a minus i 
and it's kind of the, the solution to the uh, to the square. You can see the square here right now. And now you can also slide here. So factoring three, for example, three factors in the Gaussian S3. So it's a Gaussian prime. And the fourfold symmetry just says it's up to a unit of Gaussian prime. So the units are the invertible elements. And in the Gaussian integers, these are exactly one minus one I and minus I. Uh, the ones, I, I will go back to the Einstein uh, it's just in a second, the ones on the on the square in this case, uh, for the Einstein integers, the ones on the um, hexagon. And now you can play around. So everything has a unique prime factorization. So for example, 12. 12 has up to, again, some symmetry. Well, let's, let's do 10. So 10. 10 is, um, as I showed you on the other slide, it's, this is, this is, um, so zero, one, two, this is two plus i, and this is two minus i, right? And this is one, one, so this is uh, one plus i, and this is one minus i. And you can pu pull this around because you, you are free to use units as well. So basically, um, those four elements are the prime factorization of the number 10. So here's, again, my prime factorization of the number 10. That's what I said. And these are unique up to this fourfold symmetry in this case. And you would like to study, so that's what ring theory does. It, it studies properties, it does properties of Z in a more general context. And you get some nice answers, like in this case, actually you have this nice four-fold symmetry of the, of the Gaussian primes, the primes in Gaussian integers. So let me, uh, so here, for example, any point here on this hexagon is um, a unit and nothing else is a unit. Only those six points. So primes in the Einstein it just would have a six-fold symmetry. While here the, the units are exactly those points on the on the uh, square. So everything in the uh, primes in the Gaussian integers have a four-fold symmetry. And now, as I said, just ring theory would study generalizations of those, right? Generalizing properties of the of the integers. And that's the whole point. So rings, you should really think of rings as I have the integers and whatever I can do in the integers, I should be able to do it in rings. That's not quite true. You have to throw adjectives at rings. You have to call them Euclidean, for example, if you want to have something like the Euclidean algorithm. But basically that's what it, what it is. Rings should be a generalization of integers. But that's something for, so all those properties are something for different videos. And that's basically what we are going to discuss in uh, the continuation of what is algebra. So I hope you at least like this prime pr primer video for, for what we are going to expect from ring theory. And I also hope to see you next time.